never threatening, particularly. Wigan should have scored more tries, even though the try they did get in the first half was, yes, questionable. Um, they should have had other tries, like they bombed themselves. So it just didn't feel like a highlight reel match to me at all. No, there were there were some injuries, but I think you could tell that both sides there were there were hurt bodies on both sides that were just getting themselves over the line with this. I yeah. think some some things to call out was Jake Bibby actually in his defence, where he made that try saving tackle. He made a good eight to ten meters to get there, and then to put himself in that position to to take I can't remember who it was the attacker to take him out it was will really. Have been, um... The whichever senior played for <laughs> Louis Senior, not not Innes, yeah, yeah, the other one, yeah. Um, it was top work to get there, so I think yeah, credit to Jake Bidby for doing that because he really showed the effort to to get over there. And I think the the Hastings try, this to me, it just looked like there was questions on on Ashton Golding what what he was doing. He just looked like he went far too high. And he just didn't think of it as a threat at all. It was a good spot, I think, by Hastings. And at that point when that happened, um, and I know quickly that probably the try of the try that was the pick of the game, the Hardacre one with the nice time in the well worked kick from Hastings to Hardacre. Um, at that period, around the hour mark, Wigan had kind of sorted out the sloppiness from the. They'd had the Oliver Gildart try, no try that Jerry McGilvery defended really well, actually. But Wigan had been very much in control in that second half. They, they were the better side, even though Huddersfield did did a lot of stuff to match them in the first half. They were the better side aside from their own errors, I would say, in the first half. Whereas in the second half, they just controlled it. Um, you know, if you can control a game in the in a playoffs like that in the second half, you, you're going to go far um, in in these next three weeks. But they just controlled this game at that stage, I think. So so Hastings by that point was in charge of a side that was in charge of the game um, and, and Golding just got in the wrong position because of the role Wigan were on possibly Fair enough Yeah it just it didn't quite have the sparkle and but you know, it was it was one of those tough but effective you know it, it, the job was done Yeah it it just felt like a going through the motions game where the better side on paper was going to be the side that won at the end of the game and and Wigan have won the league leader shield um what do you make of of that as an achievement this year does it come with that heavy and I, i'll be i've been told off for under pronouncing asterisk so um yeah <laughs> does it come with that heavy asterisk i think it i think it always will I think it's still a massive achievement to yeah, they've still had to play a not huge number of games in a lot of an uncertainty against all the odds. I think still to get there is still an achievement that the players should be proud of. I think though I think it it's slightly diminished this year um in some respects. I think it's more I mean it's it's the the, the achievement will still be winning through the playoffs, that's that's the golden prize. And I think, if anything, it's slightly elevated in terms of just by the, the, the sort of the breaks in the season and that kind of thing. But I think the playoffs are, are still there to go and win the league. Go, you know, go and do it. Yeah, and Wigan were on top at the break, um, partly through having played more games than a couple of other teams who had better win percentages at that, that time. But Wigan were on top at the break. Wigan beat Saints um, Wigan beat Warrington twice the only game they lost to the other playoff sides so far and I don't want to jinx it but I'm saying this is a justification for the league leaders triumph was St Helens when the kids played um, hmm. so uh, you know uh, leads in the cup um, uh, as well but in the league the only one they lost was, was St Helens when the kids played so th- there is an element of deservedness I think to, to the league leader shield win for Wigan um, we'll run through the full standards in a minute but stat line of the week it's a, t- it's, it's a tough one to pick out because you kind of think Farrell and Lawrence are almost tied with with, with the numbers they, they put up so I'm going to go and jump back to that first game and 
Kristen Inu stood out with um with stats that actually contributed to a uh, scores as on the board as well with one try one try assist 11 tackle bust getting into double figures there always impresses me and 187 meters with three clean breaks I'm going to go Kristen Inu on that on that stat line um, I think Bevan French as well I, I'm going to call out but 223 meters with two clean breaks is a season one and Ash Golding with his five tackle busts and 229 meters so it's a 200 club for me yeah um, player of the week just two games to go out and one of them wasn't that exciting so where do we go here this is a hard one um can i give it to mike lawrence just because i like him yes good you can do uh i'm gonna i'm gonna maybe go with Jackson Hastings, I guess, because he had the match-winning contributions to to the game that ultimately got him his first piece of silverware as a as a professional player. Um, uh, highlight of the week, I, I'm stay, I'm going off field and saying it was you know Wigan, my, the team I support, lifting a trophy, but it's hard to really see them lift a trophy when you can't be there to enjoy it. People have you know, say the league leader's shield is, is a bit diminished anyway behind the grand final and the Challenge Cup final. Um, I always say the three trophies to win, they all should be celebrated. It, it, it felt hard to celebrate it, but that's my highlight. Um, getting to the end of the season, I think that's got to be the highlight. <laughs> the fact that we're, we're back playing at all is some kind of minor miracle. The fact that this second lockdown hasn't stopped everything is another big achievement. So I think actually all administrators of all clubs and, and the league and the RFL deserve a bit of a pat on the back for this. Mm. Yeah, the match officials all department, here. the ground staff at the stadiums that have been consistently used over and over again um, as well. You know, well done to all of those people too. Yeah, our friends in the press who've been, you know, had their temperature done 400 times all those things. I think the fact that we've actually got to this point with, you know, a few scrapes along the way, but, you know, we've actually made it is quite an achievement. We've yeah, been able exactly. To finish the season. Exactly. And do you want to read out the final standings then for everyone um, for this uh, Super League regular season? Yeah, the irregular, regular, highly irregular season ends with Wigan on top and getting the new look League Leaders Shield, 17 games, 13 wins, 76% win rate. St. Helens and Warrington came next with 17 games, 12 wins, and on 71%. Catalan, Leeds and Hull FC complete the new look playoff picture on 62, 59 and 53% respectively. Huddersfield end 7th on 39% courtesy of Salford's points deduction. That puts them on standby. Mm. Now that's standby. How how far does it go? What point? At what point does someone drop out that they they come in? Could, would they still be the standby? I presume not. They would it still be the standby team if it went all the way to grand final week. So in the contingencies, they're the standby team for this week's fixtures. If one team pulls out of this week's fixtures, they go in. Yeah. Um. That's effectively the the side replacement side. If, if two teams pulled out of this week's fixtures, then one of the games would be a walkover. Um, I I don't think that Huddersfield could benefit from a walkover. Um, and I, and my understanding is H- Huddersfield are out of the equation for the week after when it would be the teams knocked out this week. That would be the backup oh, teams. By. Uh, the standby teams for those fixtures I suppose unless Huddersfield were pulled in already and then became a losing team from this week but we're hoping that that doesn't happen aren't we yeah and nothing else really matters Um, that also sees Cass on 38% above Salford whose deduction leads them on 28% Wakefield end things in 10th on 26% after playing more Super League fixtures than anyone else with 19 matches played and with Hull KR at the bottom club on 18% just three wins from their 17 games <sighs> wow there we go 
Do you want to talk about predictions, Super Brew, and the Fantasy League? Yeah, well, somehow in the coin toss for who got Wakefield and who got Salford last week, I ended up on the, the positive side of that, so I had two out of two, and Alan had one out of two. Uh, in the host Super Brew, I lead ahead of you, Tim. Alan third and Sarah fourth. I've not worked out the points, but I'm guessing it's still up to play for. In the main Super Brew, Steve Pye's probably run away with this already. He stays top. He's been top almost all year. James Bedford has the yellow cap this week, so though, so well done to James. Um, in the Fantasy League, Baggers stays top. <laughs> We've been saying that for three years, not just one year. <laughs> and second place, Phil White, top scored this week with 518, which from a two-game wow. week is remarkable. Um, everyone needs to make the substitutions and stuff because I'm pretty sure it runs through the playoffs, the Fantasy League. I, I'm, I'm, I think it does. And if it does, make your substitutions. And you might want to, if you're in the competition, check out Phil's side because he's found an interesting loophole that I'm going to try and exploit this week if if we can um, get keep going in that competition. Uh, so, yeah. So, heads up for that. Thanks for everyone getting the fan views in this week i know they weren't the most inspiring or controversial games um to get in touch about but thanks for people who did get in touch make sure you get in touch on next week's games which are knockout games so surely we'll have intensity to inspire us all to chat away let's move into other results So the other results section and the first game we've got to talk about was State of Origin Game 1 down in Adelaide and it finished Queensland 18, New South Wales 14 and we had Carsten of course as our first fan view on this one. He said this was probably the worst State of Origin 1 I've ever watched but we took the cockroaches down to our level and beat them at that. Both blue centres were shit and Wally is the is is the only king in rugby league Cam Munster's breath must have killed Damian Cook and Wayne is still the super coach Queenslander so when I left this fixture New South Wales were 10 nil up so my my phone went I had to go and do some work and but they were they were they were quite comfortable at that point it was all looking so good well and then at the two hour phone call later I checked the phone and it was quite a different picture yeah, I mean, me and Alan sort of jokingly dismissed this game as a one-sided romp in favour of New South Wales. Boy, were we wrong. Uh, the it was it wasn't an intense game. It didn't have the same feeling, um, and I don't think that was the location. I think that that seemed to work well, and they had a good crowd in there, a, a good stadium down at the Adelaide Cricket Ground. But the yeah, the game just lacked intensity. I guess because of the circumstances we've been in, and some, and some of the players having finished their season, which is never the case when it's played in the middle of the season. I yeah. If it's been sort of built into with the same intensity, especially by the Blues squad. Um, but, but yeah, well done, Queensland. It it wasn't the best game at all, but they were the best side. That they they defended their line really well in the first in the first period aside from those two early tries, um, and once they got in the lead, they they never really looked too threatened, which was the worrying thing, I suppose, for the Blues. Yeah, and I I think you know it's the good thing about this compressed series is that they don't have to wait too long to to go back into it. So you know, New South Wales, and they have made some changes. They they can come back at it pretty quickly. Yeah, they haven't changed the centre partnership, which um, I think is strange. Like, there was two tries, weren't there? One on each side of the pitch where the centres got pushed off the ball. Uh, look, Gagai was probably the standout player in the game f- for me. Um, Cherry Evans as well, sorry. Those two were the two standout players in the game um, for me, and, and they were involved in those moments. But Gufferson looked definitely out of place. White and not, not so much. But but that 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 slip up, um, it definitely uh, Cherry Evans stood up as the captain of this side and is the most you know one of the most experienced players and, and had his best game of the year. Yeah, finally he turns up. He right. only took one person we're, we're... to turn up, I think, in this game though, didn't it? Because none yeah. of the Blues really did, unfortunately. 
No, it was. It just did feel sort of slightly. Um, really got out of gear from the part I I, I saw. 